Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar, Swamplands, oops, sorry, Swamplands, Tundra Beavers, Quaking Bogs, and the Improbable World of Peat. I'm Jen Hawes, the Partnership Manager at Island Press, and we are so pleased to have you here today for our conversation. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to do a quick a uh, run of show and talk about some housekeeping items. So for today's event, we will be having uh, Robin Vanstone with Six Nations provide some opening remarks. Then Ed Struzik is gonna conduct a brief PowerPoint presentation to introduce his book, Swamplands. Anna Yagi of Eight Trees, who is sponsoring this webinar, thank you, Anna and Eight Trees, will do a very brief presentation as well. And then she's gonna do a more formal introduction of our panelists. And then we're going to open it up to a panel discussion with Q&A. If you'd like to submit questions, you can do so at any time through the GoToWebinar panel. You can see the highlighted section here for questions. If you have any trouble, you can report that through the questions panel or send a message via the chat. After the webinar is concluded, I encourage you to fill out our survey to let us know what you thought. That will automatically pop up at the end of the webinar. And as a, a point of reminder, the session is going to be recorded. Uh, so if you'd like a copy, we'll be sending that out the next few days. Uh, just a brief note on who we are. Island Press is a environmental book publisher. We were founded in 1984 and our mission is to elevate voices of change shine a spotlight on crucial ideas and focus attention on sustainable solutions like we're doing here today with the webinar. You can grab a copy of Swamplands from our webinar sponsor today, Eight Trees. The uh, web address is right here. We'll also share that with you as well. Um, so please do, if you're interested, get a copy of the book. And now I'm just going to do a very brief panel introduction for everyone who's here. We're going to have Mark Jemison, uh, who's a drainage superintendent as part of our panel. Bill Mays, who's also a drainage superintendent. We are going to also have James Patterson, who is a research scientist with Ducks Unlimited. And then Ed Struzik, uh, who's the author today. Robin Van Stone is with Six Nations of the Grand River uh, Land and Resource Department, and Ann Yagi, president of Eight Trees. So that is who we are having on the panel, and I'm going to now hand this over to Robin to start our opening remarks. Robin, I'd encourage you to come on to the screen so that we can see for those. Thank you. Okay. Now, Sego. My name is Robin Vanstone. I'm from the Cons from Six Nations of the Grand River. I am Bear Clan of the Mohawk Nation. I am going to be doing the opening remark this morning or this afternoon in the Mohawk language, which um, if there are any Mohawk speakers in attendance, I apologize <laughs> in advance because I am still learning the language. So you'll please bear with me as I do this. Um, so, and then I, after I, I do the opening, I will um, let you know what I said. Guayo yanale, guayo yanale. Deity no wala don't ne on question. Deity no wala don't ne yip. Mr. Honja. Deity no wala don't ne on red gasson. Turn your dog ne guanicola. Guayo yanale, 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 guayo yanale. 
Tayatino Walla Dong Le Gajun So Ah Tayatino Walla Dong Le Kahi So Ah Tayatino Walla Dong Le Ohon Dine So Ah Tanya Dohak Ne Guan Gola Guayo Yanale 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 Deatino Walla Dong Ne Ojinu no so ah. Deatino Walla Dong Ne Nong Qua so ah. Deatino Walla Dong Ne Odela so ah. Turn your dohawk Ne Guanicola. Guayo Yanale, 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 Guayo Yanale. Deatino Walla Don e Guy and Tosla. Deatino Walla Don e Gondi Leo. Deatino Walla Don e Oquile Song. Turn your dohawk, ne Guanicola. Guayo Yanale, 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 Guayo Yanale. Deatino Walla Dong Ne Ojinun Go Ah Deatino Walla Dong Ne Ladi Wellas Deatino Walla Dong Ne Gayalina Lage Tunya Dohak Ne Guanigo La Guayo Yanale Guayo Yanale, Yet so ta a son to neck a gala gua. Deatino walla don't nay or just a nukusu ah. Turn your dohawk ne guan go la. Guayo yana lay, guayo yana lay. Guayo yana lay, 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 Dirtino Walla don't ne some guire tea song. What yo yanale on a hood or low song. Turn your dohawk ne guan go la. Guire yanale, guire yanale. Guayo Yanale, Guayo Yanale, Guayo Yanale, Guayo Yanale, 
Quayo yanale, quayo yanale. Now, so what I just sang was a version of our Mohawk Thanksgiving address. And the reason this is important to us is because every day we give thanks for all of creation. We thank, um, <clears throat> as the younger, youngest members of creation, we were instructed when we were created that it is our job to look after the rest of creation because they look after us. And so every morning when I take my dog for a walk, I thank creation. And um, <clears throat> what I do is I start with the people. I thank the people that are in my life, the people that I will encounter. I always ask that I meet these people with a good mind and with an open heart. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful for everything that they bring to my life. And so I start with the people. I then go on to thank our mother, the earth, because she has provided for us absolutely everything that we need to sustain ourselves. And so we give thanks for her for that. The next thing that I thank, or uh, that I thanked in this song is the waters because they, we can't live without the waters. And so we, I thank them and it's all waters. It's the, you know, the waters in the river, the water that I shower with, the water that I drink um all waters are life sustaining so i thank them i then went on and i said the the line um the the chorus part was so our minds be as one so i'm hoping that you know everybody that i'm meeting with and that i'm sharing these words with can have that good mind and we can all be thinking the same way um, the other part of the chorus is that I'm saying it is so beautiful. All of creation is just so beautiful and I give thanks for that. So then I went on to thank the fish in the waters for all that they do because the fish have been tasked to ensure that our waters stay clean and that they provide sustenance for us. So I thank them for that. I went on to thank the fruit. We especially thank the strawberry because it's the first fruit in the spring that we have. And so we actually have ceremonies around the strawberry. And I thank the fruit. I then went on to thank the grasses. Um, and after that, I thank the bugs because every single part of creation has a role to play, every single part. And so we have to ensure that we thank all of creation. After that, I gave thanks to the medicines because again, nature is wonderful in that we get our medicines or we always traditionally got our medicines, anything that we needed from the earth. And we learned about medicines through the animals. And then I went on to thank the roots because without the roots going deep into the earth, the plants wouldn't, wouldn't do well. So I thank the roots. I then went on to thank the plants because we get a lot of, as I said, medicines, we get food. There's so much that the plants provide for us that I thank them as well. After that, I went on to thank the animals and we especially thank the deer because the deer has been with us since time immemorial and has been providing for us since time immemorial. And we're very grateful that the deer is still here and still providing for us today. So, but we thank all of the animals. And then we gave thanks to the trees and the trees again, I mean, everything in creation can survive without humans but we cannot survive without some of these things. If there were no trees, we could not survive. And so I give thanks to the trees, especially the maple, because the maple is the first to provide for us in the spring with its sap. So we think of the maple as the leader of the trees and I give thanks to the, to the maple. 
I also go on to thank the birds. And again, it's, they provide so much, even going down, you know, it's not that they just provide for our sustenance, but the beauty in their song and the beauty in their feathers is just, it's just lovely to look at. So I thank them for that. We also give thanks to the eagle because the eagle flies high in the sky and watches over us. And I give thanks that the eagle has returned to this area and is watching over us once again. Then I go on to thank the thunder beings. And again, we celebrate their return in the spring when they come back and, and start bringing clean air and clean the rains again. So I give thanks to the thunder beings. Then I go on to thank the four winds um, because again, they clean the air and it's, it's just, you know, I, we can't survive without the four winds. And then I thank our elder brother, the sun, because the sun provides so much. I mean, that helps the plants to grow, it helps the trees, it helps to keep us warm. Like there's just so much that the sun does for us. And our grandmother, the moon is next on the list because she also provides for us. And um, indigenous people are, um, we're, we're connected to all of all of creation, but Grandmother Moon holds a special place in our hearts as well. And then I go on to thank the stars because along with this, along with the moon, the stars help to light our way at night. They help us to guide our path. So I thank them. And then I go on to thank the four sacred beings. And for for me. <clears throat> the four sacred beings when i was taught about the thanksgiving address i was told that the four sacred beings are the ones that guide us so it can be interpreted as you know the guardian angels it can be interpreted any way is comfortable for each individual person but there are four sacred beings that guide us on our daily journeys um and then i go on and i think creator because without Creator, we wouldn't be here. So I give thanks to Creator. And now this song, and you know, we talk about all the beauty that Creator has created for us and how, um, you know, how important it is to look after creation. But at the end of the Thanksgiving address, especially if it's done um, just with words rather than singing, what we will do is we'll say anything that I may have inadvertently left out, I apologize, and to please include in your own way, thanks to that particular being. So the Thanksgiving address, as I said, is a very, and, and always throughout this whole song, throughout the whole Thanksgiving address, we want our minds to be as one. We want everybody to come together with good minds and good hearts. And, you know, we want to just really, really give our love and our thanks to all of creation. Because, as I said, it can survive without us. We can't survive without it. So I just wanted to, uh, to share that with you. I know that um, for, for myself personally, the Thanksgiving address, it just hits me so deep in my soul, and I'm so grateful that I've been able to learn it, especially in the Mohawk language, because I was born um, on the Six Nations. Well, I wasn't born on the Six Nations. I was born in a hospital, but um, I lived at Six Nations, and I was taken away from my family when I was um, quite young. And I have since reconnected with my family and my community. And I'm so grateful to be able to share these words with you today, but also to be able to share um, this song. For me, it's, it's very, very, very meaningful. So thank you for asking me here today. And thank you for allowing me to share that with you now. Now 
Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hello. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing anybody. Oh, we can hear you, Ed. Okay, so do you want me to start here? Yes, please, thank you. Okay, um, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing this. Um, let me just give you a little background to the book and how I got uh, the idea I got uh, for this book. Um, it actually started on a canoe trip uh, that I did a number of years ago on Banks Island, the Thompson River in the Arctic Archipelago uh, in northern Canada. It's the Thompson River, which is the most northerly navigable river in the world, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do it. I was really fascinated with this idea of canoeing a river that had never been canoed before. Uh, let me just situate it for you. It's in the Queen Elizabeth Islands, a vast polar desert where less than six inches of precipitation falls each year. And it's a very cold climate that has led to the development of permafrost that can be 1,800 feet deep in uh, some places. Um, so the river is the Thompson River, and we expected it to be a polar desert. And in fact, it that's how it started. But as we started descending north, uh, it became greener and greener. And as you can see here, uh, as far as, you, as the eye could see. Um, and, oh, sorry here. And this lush verdant valley gives rise to about 97 mosses, 83 lichen, and many, many vascular plants. And there's a vast wetlands all along the northwest coast and in the interior. And at the time of this trip, there were 80,000 muskox on the island. Um, that was two thirds of all the muskox in the world on this one island. And there were several thousand peri caribou, which are really tiny caribou. They look big in this picture, but it's the antlers. They're a little bit bigger than a Great Dane. Uh, and they are only found on the Arctic islands of Canada. And there were Arctic fox, there were Arctic wolves, Arctic hare, lemmings, rough-legged hawks, uh, peregrine falcons uh, that drop their eggs on cliff sides like this. They don't build them a nest. It's just an amazing, remarkable thing, especially in this part of the world where it can snow pretty much any day of the year and where the wind often blows uh, uh, up to 100 kilometers an hour or more. And you have ground nesting longsbirds and sandhill cranes and Pacific loons, snowy owls, uh, hundreds of thousands of snow geese uh, nest on the west side of the island. And there was even a grizzly bear den that we came across on the north end of the island. At this time, grizzly bears uh, were not found on uh, the Arctic islands. They were a mainland critter. Um, and it struck me then is that how come there's just so much life on this island when there's you know not that much life elsewhere? Uh, and I realized the common denominator in that was peat. On uh, Banks Island, uh, most of the island is covered in two, three, four, five, six feet of peat. And uh, as every gardener knows, a peat um, is a, a, a wonderful medium for uh, growing plants. Um, and that's what struck me. I realized then that there was something special about it. The, the next trip that I think sealed the deal for me about writing the book was a 66-day solo kayak trip down the Nahani, Liard, and Mackenzie rivers. Um, and uh, the trip was really a tough one. Uh, it started off uh, at Virginia Falls on the Nahani River. Uh, it pretty much snowed every day until I got to the Liard. Uh, then it rained, and as I got into the Mackenzie, it rained more, and then it got very, very hot. As uh, anybody knows anything about the Mackenzie Valley in the summertime, it can be one of the hottest places in uh, in North America. Uh, and one of the problems that I had on that trip was that my water filter uh, broke down about halfway down the Mackenzie River, and I tried to let it settle overnight, but even then it was, the water was just so incredibly silty uh, that I had to really ration how much I could drink. Uh, I just didn't want to fill my belly up with silt. And as I was heading towards the part of the river that really narrows, uh, called the Ramparts Rapids, um, I was uh, baking in like 30 degree heat, I was uh, parched, I was sunburned, I was almost hallucinating. 
and uh, I saw finally a uh, this stream flowing off a hill just before the river constricts from one kilometer wide to about a hundred meters wide and I paddled over and sure enough uh, it was crystal clear cold water flowing down off this hill and it smelled uh, very much like scotch whiskey that I had long ago dispatched and I drank heartily and then decided uh, to walk up the hill and when I got to the top I saw this most incredible wetland uh, as far as the eye could see um, and uh, there were mosses there were lichen there were orchids uh, there were moose uh, I could see signs of uh, caribou that had uh, just recently been there uh, there were a number of different nesting birds specific loons I think one percent of the eastern uh, western population nest in this area and uh, then at that point I went back to camp and I decided I'm going to celebrate I brought along a box of Kraft cheese dinner and anybody who knows what it's like to canoe for long distances uh, you can't carry much in a kayak so basically it was wean or it was beans and rice for all the way and I brought along this craft dinner to celebrate at one point along the way and as I was cooking it up uh, these ravens were cawing overhead and anybody knows anything about ravens when they start cawing uh, uh, there's something up they see something and as I looked up I could see a grizzly bear coming down the stream towards me and I took one mouthful of that uh, craft dinner and dumped the rest into the river and climbed in my kayak and went downstream not happy about the fact that I couldn't uh, have this wonderful little campsite for the uh, night but knowing that I had a book on peat. Okay so what are peatlands? Well, peatlands are bogs and fens and to a lesser extent swamps and marshes that accumulate peat in waterlogged oxygen starved conditions and peat basically is mar partially decayed vegetation that builds up over centuries and most of the peat in the world especially that in the northern hemisphere uh, came with deglaciation all that melt water uh, filled up the, in these little uh, uh, crevasses and uh, uh, sinkholes uh, that were carved out by the retreating glaciers and uh, that was how peat started to form uh, mosses such as sphagnum are the foundation of peat and sphagnum is a really interesting uh, plant it can hold up to 25 percent of its weight in moisture and survive drought and extremely cold temperatures such as this this is not sphagnum but it's a sphagnum like moss on northern Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic uh, Biologist Catherine Lafarge is a friend of mine regrew a moss that was buried under a glacier in the high Arctic for 400 years she took it back to her lab and was managed it was able to regrow it so that's how resilient they are and for want of a better term they're serial killers they snuff out vascular plants by taking up positively charged ions such as calcium and ammonium while releasing hydrogen ions and as long as there's sufficient water mosses will grow upwards and outwards shooting out capsules that contain hundreds of thousands of spores they are really the gunslingers of the peatland world nothing can shoot them down except reindeer lichen which is a fungus and algae in one symbiotic relationship uh, you can I f find out more about it but it's a really interesting duel of uh, those two plants in peatlands and peatlands are found pretty much everywhere um, almost as far north as you can go in the high arctic this is a cottonwood uh, meadow on Ellesmere Island which is the most northerly island in uh, Canada and North America and as far south in the Mojave Desert where you still have a fin a peat fin uh, proliferating it's being fed by fossil water that is 14,000 years old that's trickling underground from glaciers that no longer exist that would existed 14,000 years ago and you've got uh, peat on the Alakai Swamp on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. If anybody goes there, I uh, urge you to do this trip because it's absolutely fascinating. It's a really unique part of Hawaii. The coastal marshes such as Cape Cod and Kujibujuak of New Brunswick have peat. The Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia, Northern Carolina have one of the largest peatlands in uh, eastern United States. You can get it as high as 20,000 feet high at the base of the Sayama volcano in, in Bolivia. 
And the Zogi Marsh in the eastern part of the Tibetan Plateau is one of the largest uh, mountain fens in the world. You've got peat in Indonesia, Africa, and parts of the Amazon, Isle of Skye, and other parts of the United Kingdom, Belarus, and many parts of Northern Europe, you know, which are in deep trouble now, have a lot of peat. Russia contains the largest peatland area in the world. And bogs like Wainfleet, Sifton, Elfward were once dominant in southern Ontario. Uh, peatlands represent 90% of the wetlands in Canada and cover approximately 113 million hectares. We've got a lot of peat. Uh, it has an interesting uh, background. The Inuit and uh, the First Nations people harvested peat to build, house, build or insulate houses and indigenous women gathered moss for diapers and sanitary napkins. Uh, bog water was really coveted in uh, the days before we had uh, filtration systems. The Vikings and even the US Navy used bog water on long voyages. Why? Because when sphagnum dies, it releases these polysaccharides which block bacterial growth. And this heat helps keep water fresh. And it also prevents organic matter like bones, skin, wood, fur, and food from succumbing to decay. It's why so many centuries old bodies have been unearthed, nearly perfectly preserved in bogs in Northern Europe and Russia. It's why we know this place on Northern Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic looked like this 4.5 million years ago. This is courtesy of the Canadian Museum of Nature that hired an artist uh, to uh, draw what it would look like back then. Uh, peat was once and still is used as a source of fuel. Uh, it explained why the tiny Netherlands was a superpower in the 17th century, basically chasing the British and the Spanish around uh, the sea. They were a dominant force because they were able to turn peat into power with windmills. And uh, as we all know, uh, energy is uh, uh, measures the richness of a nation. But bogs and fens were also seen as the haunts of will-o'-wisps and jack-o'-lanterns and moss people. Uh, one of my favorite is Mora or Kikamora, uh, which is a Slavic uh, a deity. When she was brewing beer, fog rose over the bog. And my mother used to warn me about uh, Kikamora when I was a kid uh, playing uh, shinny hockey on a local bog in winter. And she said that I had to come home at night, otherwise Kikamora would follow me and she would crawl into the keyhole. And once she was in the house, lick out, the unspeakable would happen. The Jersey Devil was a legendary swamp creature that uh, people insist, like the Sasquatch, believe that it still exists and it was made famous by an NHL hockey team uh, the New Jersey Devils and by Bruce Springsteen uh, a Knights with the Jersey Devil video watch it it's really pretty cool American settlers brought these superstitions to the new world and William Byrd for example claimed that the air above the great dismal swamp on the Virginia North Carolina border was so noxious that birds flying over would fall from the sky he proposed that it be drained and turned into farmland. And George Washington, future president of the United States, was the head of the first company that actually tried to drain the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, his company used slaves to dra dig drainage canals and to cut down trees. He even got Congress uh, involved. Uh, and many of the slaves uh, on plantations around the swamp uh, escaped into the Great Dismal Swamp uh, because the landowners were afraid to come after them. They would send in their dogs to hunt them down. Uh, for others who escaped, um, uh, the swamp was a shortcut to freedom. This is really where the Underground Railroad uh, starts. Uh, they hid in the deepest, darkest parts of the, parts of the swamp before, before finding their way to Canada. But many we now know from archaeological evidence and from oral history stories is that they stayed and raised families. Um, why? Because there was an awful lot of food uh, for them to harvest. Uh, there was fish there. There was very good water, as this uh, enslaved person uh, said, the best water ever tasted by man. And if you think about it, uh, here in Canada, most of our fens and bogs um, First Nations people would tell you is that this is where you go to pick blueberries, cloudberries, uh, cranberries, 
Uh, this is where you get pharmaceuticals. There's one study that was done with uh, First Nations people that said there was a, as many as 576 pharmaceuticals that were harvested from peatlands across Canada. Uh, but, you know, the early settlers really never got it. They continued on with their prejudices. And so people like uh, Henry Flagg French, who was a leading agriculturist of his time, he saw them as the miasma of an unhealthy soils, the poison of unwholesome water. He's the guy that invented the French drain, which is still used uh, to this day to drain um, uh, water away from houses. Uh, and Congress got on board, uh, the U.S. Congress got on board, passing Swamp Acts of 1849, 50, and 60 that led to the drainage of 65 million acres of peatlands in the United States. By the 19th century, most of the Atlantic white cedars in their peatlands on the East Coast were gone. Uh, bogs like the Great Black Swamp uh, in the United States were almost completely drained on the shores of Lake Erie, and Wayne Fleet Bog nearly suffered the same fate on the Canadian side of the Erie shoreline, and you're going to hear more about that today, obviously. Um, American cities such as New York drained peatlands for park and urban development, um, but they also drained them for public health reason, because they believed what Henry Flagg French had said, that they believed that diseases such as cholera uh, rose up from those unhealthy soils. Uh, here in Canada in, the, in, in 1906, the Department of Mines became interested in the possibility of using peat such as that found in Alfred Bog, west of Ottawa, as a source of fuel for locomotives and, ho and home heating. And when that failed, scientists in the 1950 were brought in by the National Research Council to deal with what was called at the time the muskag problems. The, Na the National Research Council declared at a 1964 meeting that Canadians must learn how to build engineering structures on muskeg, how to drain it, how to utilize it, and perhaps most of all, how to travel over it. They waged war on it, and that lasted right into the 1970s. Unfortunately, too many Canadians have tried. Um, a low point, I think, came in the 1970s when scientists came up with a plan to dump waste oil on Elifringus Island in the high Arctic, right next to Ellesmere Island. Why? Because plant and animal productivity was perceived to be very, very low. Uh, in the early 19th century, the Elford Bog covered about 11,000 hectares, more than twice its present size. Uh, in Georgian Bay, peatlands have been degraded by logging, wildfire, roads, and cottage development. Uh, we see this right across North America and much of Europe. Uh, peatlands now represent just 3 to 4 percent of the Earth's landscape. But here's the cool thing. They store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests combined. And the Hudson Bay and James Bay lowlands, which is the m largest, most pristine peatland in the world, stores five times more carbon, carbon than the equivalent area in the Amazon rainforest. So it's really quite a resource. And this is where 1,000 polar bears live in summer and fall. And these female bears uh, den in peat in the lowlands. And they look something like, well, they look like this. And uh, I actually got a lifelong uh, uh, desire to crawl into one to have a look. Uh, I was with a biologist and a helicopter pilot, and we surveyed this area and were convinced uh, by the tracks that the uh, bear and her cubs had left for Hudson Bay. And so we landed in minus 35 degree weather. I crawled in, did my thing, got back in the helicopter. And then as we were uh, uh, hovering above, uh, ready to take off the helicopter pilot, poked me and said, look down. And if you can see it, there's the rear end of the polar bear. Uh, she was always there, uh, and apparently looking at us, wondering what the heck I was doing in her den. So I think that's the last time I'm going to be crawling into a polar bear den, but it's a great story. You've got both migratory tundra caribou, woodland caribou inhabit at the lowlands. Wolves prey on caribou and bear cubs. Fox feeds on what's left behind. You have one to three billion birds fly north to breed in the boreal forest, which is mostly peatland. And you have the world's highest abundance of peat-loving palm war warbler, and very likely a high proportion of the global po population of the mysterious yellow rail, a small chicken-like marsh bird that is rarely seen and little studied. You've got orchids, such as the lady slippers grow in peatlands, sundew, 
cloudberries, blueberries and cranberries, as I said, and untold numbers of moths. I was out with a uh, entomologist who was searching for a moth that he thought was extinct, and most everybody thought that they they'd once lived in sand dunes until someone found it in a fen. And he spent uh, 86 uh, nights uh, sloshing around fens in Western Canada, and he's found, I think, 86 so far. And butterflies. Uh, it's important to note that many of the largest rivers in Canada drain the lowlands, Herakana, the Herakana in Quebec, the Albany, Northern Ontario, Seal River in Manitoba. Uh, did I mention mosquitoes? Um, and as I said, you know, uh, going back to what the Vikings learned and what the U.S. Navy knows, uh, peatlands filter water more efficiently than forests do. Uh, it's one reason why the Great Lakes are being choked by algae uh, with the Great Black Swamp gone, the Wayne Fleet bog degraded, the uh, uh, Georgian Bay bogs being degraded. In fact, you know, most of the shorelines of the Great Lakes were once uh, uh, filled with filtering fens and bogs that are no longer there. So uh, those nutrients, you know, that come from very important agricultural areas that were once trapped by uh, these bogs and fens are no longer being trapped and going straight into the Great Lakes. So this is a natural filter that we could use um, uh, to prevent further choking of the Great Lakes. Uh, the other thing I learned uh, as, while researching the book is that the healthy peatland can stop or slow a wildfire. Uh, the Horse River Fire, McMaster University, Sophie Wilkinson and Mike Waddington uh, discovered that uh, had a fen that had been drained still been there, it may have slowed or stopped the wildfire uh, long enough for firefighters to get on top of it. And because peatlands, mosses especially, uh, moss-filled peatlands especially, uh, absorb so much water, they can mitigate floods. And Calgary in 2013 was up until the time the worst flood in Canadian history. And what really made it uh, uh, worse was the fact that the city had drained most of the peatlands, 80, 90% of the peatlands around the city for urban and industrial development and mosquito control. And so there was nothing to sop up all of that moisture. What really saved the day, what made it a, a lot less worse was the fact that uh, there was a very healthy fen, a beaver managed fen in the Kananaskis area that held back uh, an enormous amount of water uh, that had come down uh, during those storms. And had those fens uh, not been there, that flood would have been much more damaging. So what's the future of peatlands in the warming world? Uh, one scientist I know says that basically three to 500 kilometers of the southern boreal peatlands will be gone by the end of the century if it's business as usual. Uh, they're just going to dry up. And in the north, tund tundra peatlands will be transformed. And as frozen peatlands thaw, landscapes like this one slump and huge amounts of carbon are released. And then when wildfires come into play, it gets worse. This is a hillside like this one in Alaska that just basically totally collapsed uh, because of fire uh, burned the tundra. The northern boreal forest will also be impacted. Uh, you, I don't know if you've heard the term drunken forest, but this is where roots uh, are no longer cemented in the permafrost. So the trees end up leaning up against each other because they can't stand up straight. And drunken forests become drowned forests. And we're seeing a large area of the northern forest in Canada, the peatland forest in Canada, uh, drowning in, like this. And this is an example of skating in a drowned forest in Alaska last uh, uh, fall. It doesn't help when we build mines on mountain peatlands or strip meters layers of peat to mine bitumen in the oil sands. Uh, here's an example. Seismic exploration conducted for Alberta's oil and gas industry has disturbed at least 1,900 square kilometers of peatland and increased methane emissions by 4,400 to 5,100 metric tons per year. In the Hudson Bay lowlands, there are 18 companies now and individuals who hold 13,000 active claims in the Hudson Bay lowland. And First Nations people there that I've talked to are very concerned. Uh, of what this is going to do to their backyard. So what's in store for the future? 
you know, to some extent, we still don't know because there's still so much more to learn about peat. This is a picture plant, and it was only in uh, 2008 the University of Toronto uh, entomologists discovered that uh, uh, not only does it consume insects, but it also consumes juvenile salamanders. Uh, in 2017, uh, Alana Smolores from McMaster discovered that the Massasauga rattlesnake in Georgia's Bay den and peat. And as I said earlier, this moth was thought to be extinct until one was found in a fen in 2019. The world's largest tropical peatland was discovered in the Congo in 2017. And Dave Cooper from Colorado State and colleagues have discovered thousands of mountain fens in the Rockety, Rockies that has an extra, extraordinary number of plants and animals that cannot be found in adjoining states. And we should be eyeing our Rocky Mountains to see if we have the same thing now. We've got beavers now building dams on tundra peatlands, so this is, you know, in the title of my book. The beauty of all of this is that unlike sea ice, glaciers and ice caps, we can restore peatlands. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, the Chinese did it in the Zogi Plateau uh, after they drain, tried to drain it during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, many con European countries are doing it now because of serious erosion and flooding problems uh, and subsidence because when you remove peat, basically everything slumps and the water goes into agricultural lands and uh, uh, causes havoc for a lot of uh, far farmers. Uh, Russia is rewetting its peatland or was rewetting its peatland with the help of Germany. It was one of the largest re re peatland restoration in the projects in the world and for the single purpose of trying to stop or slow wildfires in that part of the world. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is doing it to try to shore up the shoreline from rising sea levels and storm surges. You know, we're in good shape here in Canada because we still have a lot of pre pristine, lead, uh, pristine peatland and a lot of degraded peatland that can be restored. And so what I say in the book is that we can do a lot now um, and we, we should start thinking about it. So thank you very much for having me. And I've just sent the presentation over to Anne. Can't hear you, by the way. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Let me get rid of this out of the way. I'm Ann Yagi. I'm president of Eight Trees, and I'm a retired Ministry of Natural Resources biologist. I'm here to present the Wayne Fleet Bog Ecosystem, a case study on restoration. Today, we are meeting virtually from across Canada and the, and the United States, and I would like to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all First Nations people that call this land home. There are eight snake species, four turtle species, eight frog species, one toad, two salamander species that call Wainfleet bog home. There are also at-risk migratory birds called the whippoorwill, overwintering short-eared owls, and this is a migratory waterfall stopover area. The Wainfleet bog is also a significant wintering area for deer, rough grouse, and wild turkeys. Niagara Region is located between Lake Ontario to the north, Niagara River to the east, Lake Erie to the south, and the Grand River to the west. The Wainfleet Bog is one of Niagara Region's most unique wetlands located just north of Lake Erie near Port Colborne. It is the largest continuous wetland ecosystem in Niagara. It's more than 1,500 hectares in size. It's one of the oldest ecosystems here. It's 5,000 years old. It's been nominated as, as a Canadian Key Biodiversity Area. It's also home to species at risk populations, the Massasauga rattlesnake, Eastern ribbon snake, species at risk turtles, and these populations are isolated from other populations in Ontario. The bog restoration project began in 1998, was led by the Conservation Authority and the Ministry of Natural Resources staff led the surveys and monitoring and analysis. 
experimental interior peat dams were used to raise water levels and to test what was needed to regrow sphagnum and other bog plant species. We knew very little about species that lived there. Reptiles and amphibians were thought to be the most vulnerable to habitat changes because they are resident here. They can't move elsewhere. The site is isolated. Massasauga rattlesnakes were thought to be an urban legend. Beavers, another bog species, became reestablished in late 2005. And by about 2010, we saw a decline in species at risk encounters and observations. We saw a decline in habitat quality. And in 2012 and 2016, the bog was on fire. Carbon emissions, when the bog is dried down from drainage, equal about 40,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide a year, or about 7,500 small cars a year. Ecosystem hydrology and species at risk monitoring continues today. When beavers are present in the municipal drain, the bog hydrology is stable. Let's show that with these areas here and here. <clears throat> when the bog hydrology is stable, the bog plant communities expanded. Storm events were absorbed, turtle populations improved, and over time, Massasauga populations started to increase. When the dams were removed from the municipal drain, such as here and here, water levels dropped, hibernation sites for turtles were dry, and they were exposed to freezing conditions and predators. Eventually, beavers responded to the removal of the dams and rebuilt new dams in the municipal drain and this occurred during winter, snake hibernation sites flooded in low-lying areas, while higher elevation areas were not affected. It is the change in water levels during sensitive time periods that impacts species at risk the most, and removing beaver dams removed the opportunity to maintain an elevated, stable hydrology and prevented the continuation of the bog ecosystem restoration project. So we looked at the oldest aerial imagery that we could find for the bog and it was a, that showed the, the least impacted condition, impacted, not impacted by drainage, and it was in the 1930s. The municipal drain was located 300 meters south of the bog. This area, this kind of grayish area here, is actually a remnant moat, a discharge, natural discharge area for the bog. And what happened was the municipal drain was moved forward into the bog at this location and now carries forward to the canal. This portion, the light blue area, was retired. So today, what we have is still interior ditches present that are connected to the municipal drain at several locations in this section. The municipal drain has sturdy clay walls, which the beaver have found out make the best place to put dams. So we recommend a control structure be put here at that yellow arrow which would allow the Conservation Authority to have better control of the water levels within this entire area of the bog and the rest of the ecosystem, because it's all interconnected as one system. And this would separate the municipal drain actions, which they need to do to make sure that the farmlands are open for, for agriculture purposes. And it would allow control of the bog hydrology back to a stable system, because bogs do not fluctuate in water levels on an annual basis as much as they are doing right here in the weight plate bog. And this is our preferred long-term goal. So we have presented this ecological restoration project to staff and agencies. We do not yet have approval from either the township or the conservation authority to move the drain. The engineer's report is open for the first time in 40 years, which is a good time to make this type of drain location change. The agencies propose to block some of the ditches as a short-term stopgap solution until more engineering work and EIS work is completed. This is an interim measure because we know these dams, like the previous experimental ones, will, be, will not last. Now, at the webinar, we're bringing it forward to the public for further discussion, and we have a panel of experts here today to help address these questions. We have Ed, who you've already met, as our keynote speaker. Robin Vanstone from Six Nations, you've also met. Mark Jemison is the drainage superintendent from the township of Wainfleet. Bill Mays is the drainage superintendent from Norfolk County. We have Dr. Jim Patterson here from Ducks Unlimited. He's a research scientist. And of course, we have myself here as well on the panel. Thank you very much. So let's proceed to the panel questions and answers.
I am here. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm here to uh, read out some questions that have come in from the audience uh, for our panel experts regarding the presentation. And thank you very much to everyone for a really great presentation um, to Ed and Anne and Robin. Um, for, okay, hold on a second. Uh, one question came in, I believe this is for James. Um, how can peat lands be restored when the peat takes centuries to accumulate? Go ahead. All right, can you, can you say that again, Kat? <laughs> sure. Uh, the question was, how can peat lands be restored when the peat takes centuries to accumulate? Sure. Well, I guess the you know there are a few aspects to the restoration. There's restoring hydrology, and then there's restoring the layer of peat. And so acknowledging that peat's going to take a really long time to build up, but that restoring somewhat a hydrology that mimics what the natural system would have with less fluctuations uh, would lead to the ability of vegetation and then the other species, including the species at risk that Anne mentioned, to come back. Great. I can add to that. Uh, go ahead, please, Ed. Um, I've seen uh, restoration projects uh, put into play uh, by the peat moss industry here in the in the country, and uh, it's uh, fairly fascinating that they've been able to uh, hurry up the process uh, fairly significantly by what James says. You know altering the hydro restoring the hydrology is that and that's fairly easy because water essentially follows gravity uh, and when you degrade pet peatlands you're essentially trying to make water do what it doesn't want to do and if you just sort of bring back that groundwater or surface water streams back and you have enough seeds uh, there uh, it can it can move along fairly quickly. Um, you know they've they've had some sec success in 20, 30 years where you know they've got a meter of peat accumulated. It's not perfect. It's certainly maybe not the ultimate solution, um, but uh, there's been a lot of progress done in that area. You know they've got 86% of the plant species have been restored to peatlands that have been badly degraded, uh, which is pretty good measure. Not perfect, but uh, I think. You know, if we get more investment, you know, perhaps from the federal government, the provincial governments in this area, we can move this along. But it is, you know, truly a long process. So it's better not to degrade peat than to try to spend so much time uh, investing in, in accumulating it. Good answer. That's great. Yeah, great answer. Um, I have a question here for Robin. What does restoring the Waynefleet bog mean for the First Nations community? I would like to clarify that I'm speaking for Six Nations of the Grand the Six River. Nations, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm not speaking for First Nations people in general. The, um, the Waynefleet bog, along with a lot of other places, I mean, that, that drain was put in without consent, without consultation or consent of our nation. And I think that um, had we been consulted, we would have said, no, that is not okay with us. And the reason for that is because every species on this planet has a habitat. And when you go and start destroying habitats, that's when you start destroying species. And so one of the arguments that I make with proponents all the time, and it's usually around wetlands, not specifically around um, bogs, but um, people, um, so, so the concern I have is that People want to fill in wetlands, and it's just equally as bad to um, to re to redrain a bog. Like it just it doesn't make any sense. the The creation of this planet was created from so much bigger a 
an outlook than than we can as humans can even grasp like when you start thinking about all of the different ecosystems and all of the different species and each one has its own purpose in this world and so to restore this back to its original drainage i think is it's a plus for us it's like ah oh, finally somebody's listening and so it's it's just one of the little steps because one of the things that I have noticed is that there is a growing restlessness amongst Indigenous peoples about the fact that our voices aren't being heard. We know what we know and it, we may not have the scientific backup, but we don't need that. We have years and years and years, thousands of years of living with nature of living with the ecosystems and and animals to know that destroying habitat is not the answer to anything great Does that the question? Yeah. yes i think it does and i guess following with the uh, concept of restoration i think this is a question for bill mays um Okay, so the Drainage Act can work together with wetland restoration. Um, the engineer's report for the Biederman drain is open for the first time in 40 years, and we have not been able to move forward with getting a request to move the drain. Using your experience in managing drainage systems and restoring wetlands, how would you suggest we move forward to move the drain out of this wetland? So here in Norfolk County, um, we have a wetland restoration program or project that we've done with the Conservation Authority and Mystery Natural Resources for over 20 years here, um, where we've taken areas where historically a municipal drain was constructed through or near a wetland area and uh, basically reversing the drainage, retaining the water in the wetlands or uh, in, in the bogs. Um, the majority of the projects were taken as one-off projects. They were initiated through feasibility studies. Um, a, a study was completed, prepare the plans and reports, and determine the practicality of the project. Um, a big part of those reports, from my perspective, was the landowner input. Um, the municipal drains were constructed for the agricultural lands. Um, Obviously, once the drains are constructed, the ag moved in or residential lots moved in. And by undoing that, if you're going to impact a land, that uh, that will get very contentious. Um, so through the feasibility study, they would do some knocking on doors, gain interest from all affected landowners. And then they do the um, financial investigation. What is this going to take? And who's going to pay for it? Um, the drain inject is very a it's I, I often refer to it as a user pay system. Um, the owners on the drain and the municipality pay for the maintenance, similar to a local improvement where a sidewalk's constructed in front of your house in some municipalities, the municipality puts those costs on the owner. The municipal drains, the construction and maintenance goes to the owners. So in mm -hmm. in the majority of our projects, we had third party funding from environmental agencies to implement the engineering and the construction works. Um, in most cases, there is little to no cost to the owners. Um, in the case of this project, um, relocating, that would be a endeavor to determine what the actual cost of relocating would be. Uh, with the existing report being open, uh, timing is of essence with drain reports. Um, the engineers are supposed to, and municipalities want them in, set, and done quick. Um, so there's a little bit of an overlap scheduling wise. It, I, I understand that they're going to a draft design in the next uh, month or two here. Um, so what I would look at in Norfolk is let that drainage act process go, and you can initiate another a separate engineering process, we would usually recommend the same engineer, he knows the background, he knows the report, and to work on the wetland component. The 
what we would do is we would take the feasibility to study and a letter of intent or a memorandum of understanding regarding the financing to council. And that's when the owners aren't arguing about it and the municipality is not going to get stuck with a bill. Um, 90% of the time, municipality simply adopted a, a resolution to appoint the engineer to proceed with the engineering to do the relocation or the wetland restoration on the on the municipal drain. Um, the the handy thing we we promote the drainage act is a tool. It's just one of many things you can use. It's, it's there's been a big change in the last ten years. The drainage act isn't just for draining. It's for managing water. Um, we've restored even if you're holding four inches of water in the bottom of the channel that does restore the hydrology within the ground as well um in your case here by putting retention on the drain i don't know the exact profile of the drain but how far could you hold water up before it started affecting the, the farm crops would be a, a good question that might be able to be answered through the current report but uh, depending on the stage of the current report would makes a big difference on on where they go with the engineering. The engineer's got a certain level of effort he has to do and to add to that as the overall cost and municipality. If it went to court cases and stuff like that, the municipality tends to get stuck with the costs and that's why I understand the municipality would not want to take on an extra project with a lot of background take going into it. So I hope I, I kind of roundabout an answer, <laughs> oh, that's good. Them, but I good answer. get what you're after. So. I think that was great information, thank you. And this next question is for Mark. So from the perspective of the Township of Wayne Fleet. And so if we imagine that the request was made by the landowner to move this drain as the local drainage superintendent, how might you use your skills and knowledge to help the landowners come to terms with a change in a drain location? Sure, thank you. Um, so kind of as Bill mentioned, uh, I'd reiterate that the municipality is responsible for managing that drain on behalf of the community so the community of landowners if they've, they've brought forward that request um, it's taking place on private property uh, we, we have to have their buy-in unless you know, they're paying for it in the future um, so it, within the township we utilize municipal drains across the whole township we've got 250 kilometers of municipal drain that serves agriculture residential commercial institutional uh, we're able to manage that, as Bill said, because of the tools that the Drainage Act provides. Um, so I would explain to the you know other landowners that uh, are involved in the project that the Drainage Act gives us these tools, and some of those are um, damages and allowances that are paid uh, when we do these types of projects. So um, the the landowners are compensated through the Drainage Act for the access to their property, for the loss of their property, um, and, and within the future maintenance that space uh, they're paid. For, for access. Um, so we'll be able to discuss those options um, and how uh, there will be some dollars coming into their pocket or uh, offsetting the costs for the benefits that they receive um, from a potential relocation. Um, we'll also be able to talk about um, the tools of the Drainage Act if they're not satisfied. The Drainage Act does provide um, recourse for impacted landowners who aren't satisfied uh, to appeal the process. So there's three different appeal um, options for each landowner and that would be court of revision, drainage referees and the drainage tribunal. So if they're unsatisfied with um, the results of the report, uh, they have the ability to voice their concerns and um, make alterations to the process before before the drain would go forward. Um, so again, it's you know community-based project, so it's important. Uh, as the projects take place on private property to have uh, the buy-in and the drainage act can, can give us the tools to, to bring everyone on board. Thank you. That's great, thank you. And I have some questions coming in about this, so I'm gonna say the questions and someone please volunteer to answer. Um, okay, so the drainage act has provisions to formally close a munis municipal drain. Could this help with, in the Wayne Fleet bog? Also, has anything come of the province's review of the Drainage Act, which I believe began a year ago. Question mark. Go ahead, Bill. So I've, I've heard of one municipality where there was a drainage system close to a wetland. It was not a bog or a fend, but they, in opposed to going around, the engineer was proposing to bore a solid, 
basically a sealed gas pipe through the wetland so they could address the drainage on the upstream end um, set a static water level and then the water would bypass the wetland area and go to the outlet portion i never did hear if that was actually constructed as per their thoughts it'd be interesting to see how that worked or not um and the and i apologize what was the second part of your question was about the changes to the drainage act um the drainage act had a new regulation enacted in june of 2021 um which brings in um some minor alterations there's this supposed to be a streamlined process for minor alterations to a drainage system i was considering that in this discussion but uh it's all the way they enacted it only affects one property mm. um so as soon as you affect more than one property it's not applicable um it, for the most part it is additional uh, consultations like they brought in the uh, mandatory aboriginal consultations on all uh, um, at the onset of the projects and through throughout and uh, there's a couple minor changes to the act but they didn't really get into a lot of work i would say the bigger change would be there's a new superintendent or drainage engineer's guide that talks a lot about green infrastructure um, incorporating infrastructure and wetland components into drainage designs for the engineers and superintendents to consider so there's a lot more uh, thought to that like you said in the last 10 years that's been a kind of a change of thought under the drainage checks so. okay and i'm we have several questions i'm going to continue and we'll try to answer the rest i believe via email but um i'm going to pose this one uh i think the scientists will answer it um are we able to discuss the role of peat bogs in climate change can we discuss the value of fauna reintroductions with bog reestablishment? For example, Pleistocene Park? I don't know who wants to address that. <laughs> I, 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 I can. Um, well, Pleistocene Park is a crazy idea. Um, I don't know if you heard it. It's uh, in Siberia. There's a, uh, a scientist and his son are trying to reintroduce um, uh, ungulates, the theory being that uh, if you pack down the snow hard enough, uh, you will actually, uh, it'll take a longer to melt and it will hold the permafrost together. Uh, so essentially reintroducing caribou, muskox uh, on a massive scale into the Siberian lowlands, uh, which uh, is kind of you know he's got a lot of attention he's he's a darling of the new york times and many newspapers but anybody knows anything about reintroduction it's fraught with uh, all kinds of liabilities it's really really tough to uh, uh re-establish a critter uh, that hasn't been there in the longest period of time and there's all kinds of ramifications associated with it uh they tried to reintroduce uh, bison for example into a wetland area uh, in uh, I think it was Colorado and 50% of the area turned into a desert because of the erosion that they ended up creating in a completely different climate. So I, 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 I think that's a big, big mistake. I think what we have really here in Canada is we have, you know, the most intact peatland system in the world. And I think what we need to do is figure out which ones hold the most amount of carbon. You know what we need to do, here, here it is. We need to bring in accountants to come in and to evaluate the true value of these ecosystems. Take into account, I mean, if there are 576 pharmaceuticals that First Nations people use, rather than going to you know, the drugstore, what's the value of that? What's the value of a caribou? Caribou we know inhabit, uh, you know, 50% of their time in peatlands and in the north, a caribou basically, five caribou is a winter's worth of meat. So it is basically a refrigerator, a grocery store for, for people. It stores carbon, uh, it filters water, it prevents uh, land from subsiding. And in Canada, it is essentially a nesting ground for three billion birds that fly north and come back south with you know, equal or more that number. If we start doing that kind of an accounting, uh, then we can go back to either the Trudeau government or whatever government we have in the future and, uh, and say to them, listen, you're gonna spend $4 billion planting trees across the country. Uh, 
Well, the fact is trees will grow themselves. They seed on their own. This isn't a big, this isn't a, it, it, this is sort of a, a tree hugging idea. Uh, why don't we just restore, four, spend $4 billion helping Bill, Mark, uh, Anne, uh, restoring or protecting wheat peatlands that we exist because they they have a very small f footprint uh, mm -hmm. and they have they provide s so many different ecosystem services. Could you imagine what we could do with a four billion dollar plan to restore peatlands and empower small communities that you know don't have the resources, the tax base to be able to initiate these very costly engineering projects. I think that would go a long way rather than, spe than spending $4 billion growing trees. And as we know, you can build, you can burn 100 million trees in this country in a week with a wildfire. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, we're gonna have to wrap up. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and we're going to still answer the questions that come into the chat line. Catherine's taken that down. Um, we will, um, I just want to thank